Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Entrepreneur Mindset Mastery Podcast. My name is Simon Page, and uh, with me is Robert from Add Value to Life Coaching. Um, welcome. Uh, this is the podcast where we try to break down the challenges that you face every day, making it through the entrepreneur lifestyle uh, so that you can live bigger and grow your business. And uh, today's going to be a really good podcast. We've got a lot of uh, a lot of great ideas here, and we are talking specifically about imposter syndrome. Exactly. And uh, I, I guess we subtitled it, Quiet the Liar in Your Head. And so <laughs> um, partly why it's called imposter syndrome is, is specifically a voice in your head that uh, here's your idea or your business plan, um, that next big dream, and basically it says no. And <laughs> either either telling you that you're not good enough or uh, you're a fake or you're uh, you don't deserve that you're not worthy <laughs> any number of those uh, those voices that we we've heard in our head um, telling us that we don't measure up and that we're not the right person to to be doing this and so um, all obviously lots of folks, I've had imposter syndrome. I mean, you can you can search for it. You can it, it comes and goes in the life of an entrepreneur, and uh, there definitely needs to be some daily habits that can help you um, deal with that. So, so scientifically, let's talk about what's going on, what's what's happening. Why 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 do people have this voice in their head? <clears throat> Trying to keep you safe. Exactly. We like to use. I like to use lizard brain. I I, I like lizard brain or or even caveman brain, right? So if we talk about our lizard brain or our, our caveman brain, that it it's really about self-preservation. And that part of our brain that says, if I go in that dark, scary hole, something's going to eat me. <laughs> um, obviously, very few of us encounter dark, scary holes where there's somebody going to eat us. And yet, <laughs> we still react to these new challenges in our life, um, basically in the same way that our caveman brain designed us to act. Um, and it's really about. It's so inherent in our biology that it's not something that we consciously think of. It is, it is. Um, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to mind blank now. The, the part of the brain right there. Um, what is it? Is what it amygdala? It? Yes. Yes. Thank you. It's the amygdala. The amygdala is the part of the brain that understands emotion, but not reason. And so that's that's why that's why uh -oh. <laughs> sorry about that. That's why when you're when you're having this this uh, the imposter syndrome is flaring up, you can rationalize your way through it all day long, but you're going to have that little voice that what you call the caveman brain or or the amygdala popping that into your brain saying yeah but yeah but yeah but right exactly. So really, what it's trying to do is. Self-preservation has become maintaining the status quo. And so even though our life is not yeah. physically at risk, or it's there's some mental protection things, but really it's trying to keep us in the zone of normal. Um, some people might call that the comfort zone. Um, the brain's plan is in self-preservation. I want to do the same things I've done every day. I want to keep things the way that they are. And in, in the manner of keeping things in the way that they are, I'm going to do that little voice is going to do whatever it needs to do to keep you from trying something new or trying something bigger or better or believing something grand about yourself. And not just, not just the, the whole, um, oh, crap. <laughs> ah, I, I love this topic and, and I've got so many thoughts going all over the place. And, and it's not just about the status quo, like whatever society society thinks is like, you know, the way things are. It's also about what you subconsciously and consciously believe about yourself. It's, it's your belief structure that is really going to, like, determine how you respond and when it comes up for you. Absolutely. It, it has to do with the comfort in your daily activities, your daily habits. In fact, that's why addictions become so strong is because they become a part of that comfort system. And yeah. it's actually that same self-preservation that can hold a person in addiction because their brain is saying, this is necessary for my survival. And that's the same problem that, that they have, right? They try to rationalize their, 
their addiction away. Oh, I want to quit. Oh, I want to quit. Oh, I don't want to do that anymore. And, and all that rationale uh, deals with the brain at a different level and doesn't deal with the comfort zone status quo level that's, that's really trying to keep you alive. Right. And, mm-hmm. and trying to satisfy that survival need. And, and that's the only reason why imposter syndrome keeps coming back. No matter, no matter how good you get, no matter how much money you make, no matter how big your business is, that imposter voice is still going to jump in there and try to stop <laughs> your growth. Um, yeah, some, it it some happens to so many. Some of the biggest celebrities and businessmen suffer from imposter syndrome. Um, Howard, his name came up when I was researching part of this episode, but I can't remember that he's a former CEO of Starbucks. You may have heard of it. <laughs> has imposter syndrome, right? Tom, oh, I, many athletes, many, many. I, I mean, one of my favorite uh, recent podcasts this last year was Tim Ferriss interviewing Hugh Jackman and 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 Hugh wrestling with imposter syndrome. Um, and he shares the story of, of the making a greatest showman and how he just felt completely inadequate throughout that whole process. And of course, if you've seen the film, it's incredible and his performance is incredible. And there's just so many great stories of living out your dream that, 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 that movie in itself is an answer to. <laughs> and so it's, it's mind boggling to think of all the people that wrestle with imposter syndromes at different levels in their career mm-hmm. And the reason to have a coach or to have outside voices that can help you recognize these things and, and push through them, right? Of course, is the purpose of of helping entrepreneurs through through this podcast and, and helping them change their beliefs about themselves and helping them change what their comfort zone looks like, right? And what their comfort zone feels like for them so that it becomes a very different prospect um, leaning into that or leaning against that voice <laughs> that's trying to discourage you from making changes. <clears throat> One of my favorite anecdotes about imposter syndrome was how Maya Angelou, internationally acclaimed poet, humanitarian, uh, gave an interview shortly before she died, right after the publication of her final book. I believe it was number 14. <laughs> and, and in this interview, she said, oh, I always feel like every time a new book comes out, I always feel like this is the one where they're going to figure out I'm a fraud. <laughs> that, that language sounds very similar to, to other famous authors and, and even actors, right? That, that voice that, you know, the, Oh, they're going to figure out that I'm a fraud. They're going to figure out that, that this isn't real. Um, and, and that's so for others on the outside, looking at it going, well, obviously that's not true. That's, that's mind boggling, right? Like, <laughs> You're one of the greatest in the world at what you're doing. It was you on the screen, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, was, so, how could you be a fraud? Yeah, Tom, so, Tom Hanks has a problem. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> multiple Academy Awards, multiple millions of dollar productions. Yeah, crazy. Yeah. So okay. we talk about being comfortable in our, our habits and daily activities and, and our plans, right? And that voice doesn't want us to change those, doesn't want to in what we believe about ourselves, And so really a big part of imposter syndrome is helping us change our beliefs about ourselves in order to change the habits and daily activities that, that we're doing every day and, and how those impact what we think about ourselves. Um, and so most of our beliefs about who we are and how the world works were, were planted in us. We didn't come up with those by ourselves. Um, People in authority in our early lives, of course, our parents, our teachers, um, our church leaders gave us our worldview, gave us our beliefs, not just about ourselves, but our relationship with the world around us. Um, and of course, we could we could jump and throw in a bunch of things, people, beliefs people have about money um, that are very limiting beliefs that imposter syndrome plays right into. Right. Like, you know, if I said money doesn't. And Simon answers grow on trees. <laughs> I'm sorry, you you I, I broke I, up. I heard, I heard you go silent and I thought you were having a broadcast trouble again. Oh I wanted yeah. to a quote because what you just said totally reminded me of this, and I don't remember the entire quote, but it's from a book we often reference called As a Man Thinketh. 
And uh, as a man's mind, a man's mind may be likened to a garden which may be intelligently cultivated or allowed to run wild, but whether cultivated or neglected, it must and will bring forth. And if no useful seeds are put into it, then an abundance of useless weeds will fall therein and continue to produce their kind. And when you talk about like the people in our past, our parents, our church leaders, our teachers, planting seeds within us. And, you know, as children, we're not taught to, to cultivate our thoughts, right? So it's, it's absolutely normal for people to grow up and go into adulthood with this weed garden of all of these things that have been planted and grown in kind because they didn't know how to, how to prune it, how to tend it. And that's part of what personal development is. It's about going through and pulling the weeds out of your mind. And, and pulling the weeds is what we're talking about here with imposter syndrome. How do you Absolutely. change small talk? How do you, you know, like we'll get into that later. But, but yeah, there's a perfect analogy. I should have put that in the notes. Yeah, it's great. And thank you for sharing because, because it really does explain why, where do these thoughts come from, right? Where do, where do these beliefs come from? And there's a couple of things that we're never taught when we're growing up and one is how to form beliefs. <laughs> and the second is to think um, we are rarely challenged to think into new things and think differently than, than just ruminating on, you know, on the things that have happened or regurgitating um, things that were, you know, in school, we're taught all these things that we simply just must memorize and regurgitate. Well, how, versus many, how many of you, uh... new. How many of you took critical thinking 101 in high school? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so the challenge is how do we how do we root out the weeds right from the the value? And and of course, a lot of those weeds were planted unintentionally many times, right? Like our parents telling us, well, we don't have money, right? We don't have enough for that or we can't afford that um, we can't do that uh, and of course it goes back to things like money doesn't grow on trees um, other other statements and beliefs that that have been just passed down um, and, and repeated you know over and over again <laughs> in our lives and, and it belief about money it affects our belief, our worthiness to me, it affects how we feel about wealth, right? Because some of us are taught that the rich people only steal, right? You have to steal to get rich or, or you have to be a, a swindler um, or you have to be lucky. Only bad people get rich. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and those, those mistaken things become rooted in, in who we are, whether we believe that's true or not, or whether we, we, we never challenge that belief. We never challenge that seed that's taken root. Um, and so really a lot of this in imposter syndrome and, and even in mindset coaching is really about recognizing those seeds, recognizing the weed that's grown and then being able to say, Ooh, that doesn't serve me. How do I, how do I root it out? Yeah, you know, you said you said two things. You said we're not taught two things in life. And I think those are really core and critical to understanding and conquering imposter syndrome. I'd like to actually visit those for a minute. Yeah, absolutely. One was how to form a belief, and the other one was how to think our way into new thoughts. Let's talk about those. How do how if someone were listening I'd love them to come away from this podcast with, okay, I know what to do now to form a new belief. So how do we, how do you form a new belief? Well, I think first is to recognize what, what is a belief, right? Like, I mean, I guess we're taught, you know, I, I believe in the country. I believe in, you know, uh, the power of, I don't know, just different things that, that all of us believe in, right? You can, you can believe in God. You can believe in a, a higher power. Um, but, but really our beliefs really, especially, oh. God bless you, our beliefs about ourselves, right, determine how we act and, and how we see ourselves in the world. And so those beliefs really are recycled self-talk. They're, they're the voice in our head that we've allowed to repeat over and over again and tells us who we are, right? And so if you're driving to work and you say, you know, oh, I'm miserable, 
you know, oh, I'm frustrated. Oh, I'm tired. I'm, I mean, you hear more and more people if you ask them how they are today, and this whole country's tired, right? Everybody's saying how tired they are, and, and uh, or how miserable they are, or how unhappy they are. Well, those become beliefs because they become recycled self-talk, and so so they affect your reality. They become true in your life when you start to live them out. And and as you and I are both advocates of James Allen, as a man thinketh, mm-hmm. these, these thoughts are creative and these thoughts aren't just um, effects, they're causes. And so as soon as you start to repeat these thoughts over and over again, they become causative in your life. We're human beings. We're human, not we're not a human effects, right? We're not the results of our conditions and circumstances. And so many people live their lives as if they're a result, as if they're an effect. And and basically the world around them, everything around them is happening to them and, and they feel out of control. And of course their beliefs play into that, right? I'm a victim. Oh, you know, this happened and that happened and this happened and all these things are, are impacting who they are at the core level and and they aren't trained aren't prepared to face the world and say i'm in control i'm in control of my thoughts and i'm in control of my circumstances and even when bad things happen to me i can control the outcome (laughs) And, and so rather than seeing bad things happening to them as you know i'm a recipient of the bad karma in the world they can, you can actually say, wait a minute, I'm in control. There is no karma except for the karma that I create through my actions. And, and, and we face the world in a different way. And so how do we change those beliefs? How do we, how do we root those out? Um, so I think the first part is awareness, right? So, so first step is I have to be aware of what belief is causing me to behave or think this way. Um, and of course, I think a negative thought life uh, is a very powerful symptom of of some poorly laid beliefs, right? So if you have a negative reaction when you're driving or you have a negative thought about other people, road rage, that road rage is absolutely a symptom of of some a poor belief system, right? But it can be it can be rage against your family. I think any kind of negative emotions, um, if it brings up a negative emotion and that can be anger or that could be um, depression or uh, frustration or uh, any of those can be, can be symptoms that are, that are saying something in your belief system needs to be checked. Right. But of course you have to have that self-awareness to be able to say, Oh, wait, that was a sign. (laughs) Let me, let me, let me follow that up. Right. What, how do I think into that and how do I figure out what the root of that is? Right. So we're talking about monitoring our self-talk, right? And then using critical thinking to analyze what we're saying. And then turning that on its head. Exactly. Yeah. So then, so then once I've, I'm, I'm aware, right, I've raised my awareness to listen to my self-talk to be aware of the things I'm saying to myself. And then when I'm saying negative things to myself, what, where are those rooted in? What, what, what did that come from? Right. Uh, For some people, it it could be a simple statement from a teacher that said, you're not good enough. Right. Or you can't do that. And, and sometimes it's our teacher not trying to discourage us, but trying to protect us Um, like a parent trying to, uh, their son wants to be an NFL football player star yeah and, and a parent says oh don't 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 shoot so high right no, maybe maybe not nfl right <laughs> three the three most debilitating words in parenting that's not realistic ah ooh, i like that yeah exactly um yeah. realistic what real world are you in right like <laughs> yeah tell that to you know tim tebow Tell that to Michael Jordan's parents. Did they tell Michael Jordan, no, you'll never make it to the NBA? See, that that's the challenge. And, and in that self-preservation or protection mode of a parent, and, and it's understandable, it's recognizable where parents share some of these, right? 
Most of their beliefs about money they got from their parents or from their personal experience with money. And most of their beliefs as, as a parent, as far as raising a child and protecting them, it's real similar to that the imposter voice in your own head, right? Your parents are trying to protect you from getting hurt and protect you from facing consequences. And the, the sad thing is that we learn so much from those consequences and there's so many lessons that are lost in that and we lose the ability to step out right to take that risk because because we've been protected um and held back and so the voice in our head is actually multiplied by the voices of those people trying to protect us and yeah it's 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 crazy but of course then it comes to how do we how do we change that right now we've we've recognized it We've said, ooh, what is that, right? I think the really powerful question is, is to ask your, ask your brain why, <laughs> right? Why, why did you bring that up now, right? <laughs> and, and, and our brain loves the question why, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. it's, it's like the, un, the I was going to say unanswerable. No, it's the unignorable question. <laughs> yeah. I, uh it and and the brain the brain will help you root it out like you might you might never know who who planted the seed um sometimes you find the seed and you're you're able to say oh yeah that was my uncle joe and he did that you know at that party on march 15th <laughs> and know an exact point in time when that seed got planted um others it's just going to be a simple oh right and you're going to realize every time x happens i think this yeah. Or every time I have a big dream, an idea, like, oh, and and the worst thing about ideas now, now is right. You, you come up with this idea and you think, oh, it'll be this great thing, and then you give it up right away, right? The voice in your head says, oh, that's not for you, boom. And then you hear somebody else that did that, and you look at it, and go, I had that very same idea. Yeah, right? you you let it loose. You turn it back <laughs> into a child. Somebody else picked it up, and. And there's so many ideas that we're meant to run with that were designed just for us. And, and of course, we ignore them because we've allowed that imposter voice um, to hold us back. I've got a great quote that a fellow um, coach has shared with me, and I, and, um, I just like to share it. And I'm not sure who Marianne Williamson is. I guess I should have looked that up. But uh, Marianne Williamson says, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask, our, we ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine, as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. That's really powerful. Um, she was actually a candidate for presidency in 2020 for a while. Wow. She didn't. She didn't. Uh, she didn't stay in the race very long. But she's. I just. I. I looked it up while you were reading that. She's also a, a very prolific author. She's got like 13 books, and and this is very uh, in line with like the type of books that she writes. Nice. That, that's really power. Powerful. I love your playing small does not serve anyone or you're not serve the world. That is, oof. There's a, there's a others that have said similar, similar quotes. The idea that, that we hold ourselves back so that others can, can be better or, or that holding ourselves back is in some way in line with what we were created for. Right. Yeah. That the idea that, that God would want you to hold back. <laughs> It, it is is mind-boggling right we were created for greatness and we all should be aspiring to greatness and and not hold ourselves back <laughs> um and so yeah that that's a it's fantastic um and the idea she uses light and the idea of 
of lighting the darkness hold instead of holding yourself in the darkness and then and then your light of course when you bring light into any room you it spreads to everybody and so that's that's always super powerful to see we want to be a positive force um, and help others be positive forces and of course it starts with each of us right like you can be a positive light in your own life you have to be a positive light in your own way or for yourself i mean you can you can try to do it for others but i don't think that you really become effective until you're able to do it for yourself and um that's actually the the fourth step we talked about recognizing how to form a belief we talked about recognizing what a belief is monitoring your self-talk thinking critically about the things that you tell yourself the fourth step to that is changing the dialogue right that's where you have to take that thought that you're continually having and turn it into an empowering statement like if you're if you're constantly thinking i i i'm constantly miserable then turn that into an empowering thought that uh, I, I face challenges with courage. Nice. Right? So whatever it is that you're thinking continuously, create something that counters it that is positive, and then every time you catch yourself thinking that negative thought, you force the positive statement out instead. This is how you break a negative belief. And it can be as simple as adding the word yet, because yet gives your gives your brain hope right especially when you're thinking about money right i don't have enough money difference of adding the word yet to that i don't have enough money yet yeah changes how your brain reacts to it and so it can be as simple as just adding yet to the because you're in process and and your brain recognizes in it fact it likes you being in process so let's give a couple examples of turning some of these around let's talk about an identity statement like like I'm not good enough. What's a good way to turn around an identity statement? I'm not good enough yet. I'll take it. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, I'm not good enough. How would we turn that around? Um, I am capable and I am growing. Nice. So then the next one's insecurity, right? A lot of us have insecurities um, and we don't feel ready. I'm not ready yet. Oh, it already says yet. Oh, I'm not ready. Yeah. Well, I'm not ready yet can still be a limiting belief. Sure. Right? Because it's, it's I don't want to take action because I'm not ready yet. And, it, and while we're, we're talking about adding yet, I, I encourage you to find a, a fully positive now statement rather than a, I mean, it's good to future cast. It's good to say, someday I will be ready. Someday I will be everything. But it's better to, to change, to break a limiting belief and to, and to grow your current state of uh, awareness and, and how you're playing in the world. It's best to make empowering statements that are in the present tense. So I'm not ready. Um, I am... Well, I love I am capable because it means that you have the ability to handle what comes your way, right? So I am I'm capable and I can course correct. I can take the next step. Right? I, I only have to know one step ahead, right? I don't have to know everything. Well, and the crazy, the crazy thing, we make all these plans and the truth is, once we take action, the plans change, right? They shift, they're different. And and so I, I shouldn't be making a plan 10 steps out anyway. I need to know when step one and step two, because that's what's going to show me what step three and four are going to be. Create so the, really, create the vision, create the first three steps. I'm an action taker. That's that's another great. Oh, I love I'm that. An action taker. Yeah. I'm an action taker. I'm stealing that. There you go. So that the next insecurity or, or area where imposter jumps up is who would listen to me? Man, this one got me so much when I was first starting out on this journey. Who would listen to me? Because I'm so much less than everyone else. Because well, sure. 
because there are so many others who are already on the same journey saying the same things I am, but who have been saying it for 10, 20, 30 years. Well, sure. Yeah. Think of Tony Robbins, right? Like, well, they, they can just go listen to Tony, right? (laughs) But the truth is there's people that don't identify with Tony's and Tony's story. That's really what it comes down to is your voice will resonate with your audience and no one else's will quite as much. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that's how it is. Who, who would listen to me? Everyone who is right to listen to me. Exactly. I don't, I don't, how would you turn that around into an empowering statement? I have a powerful message that resonates with my audience. Very good. I, I am building an audience that yeah. likes what I hear. Or likes what I share. I remember the dawn of enlightenment that happened. Call it an aha moment that happened when I hit 10 followers. <laughs> Woo! Woohoo, right? I'm still a nobody, but here's 10 people who have raised their hand to say, I want to hear more from this guy. You know, that's that's. That's invigorating is what it is. Because if Absolutely. you if you can get 10, there's no reason you can't get 10,000. Exactly. Just well, and, and you scale it. And and the truth is there's people that are going to identify with your experiences, your story and and your solutions differently than than any other coach or any other professional or any other expert out there, right? Yeah. And, and that's really what we're trying to do is help entrepreneurs help people share their expertise, whether, whether that's as a plumber or as a business coach, um, you're the expert in, in your area. And, and I know that that's, that's probably the hardest thing for anyone to feel like they're, they're the best, right? And that's what we kind of set ourselves up with expert, right? They're the, they're the best of the best, but the truth is you only have to be better than the majority. <laughs> you don't have, you only have to be better than, than a few others to to differentiate yourself, and even diff- differentiating doesn't have to do necessarily with a skill or ability. It has to do with maybe they just like your voice better. Maybe they just yeah. like how you how you talk to them better. Um, and so so there's lots of different differentiations between. There could be one tiny thing about your past that makes you more relatable than Tony Robbins. Well, oh. you know Tony Robbins. Raised in a broken home by a, a, an abusive alcoholic mother who abused him out of her fear, not, not trying to slam anyone, but that's, that's a story, right? When your story resonates with someone, you know, I'm, I'm a former software engineer who discovered personal growth and entrepreneurship way too late in life, right? That's going to resonate with a certain type of people. You know, I tell a lot of geeky jokes, <laughs> you know? People will resonate with you because your story is more like them than Mr. Billionaire did it for 30 years because you relate. Well, and, and, and they're in different stages on the journey too, right? So recognizing that yeah. somebody's at a different stage on the journey, some people don't want to jump on Tony Robbins train because he's, he's gone a long ways down the track. Right. And yeah. of course, you know, you just look at him as like, well, he's got millions. He's got this billion, you know, um, I guess a recent thing I've seen is all these, a lot of these gurus, a lot of these, these experts that have tens of thousands of, of followers are all, you know, what if I lost it all? I had to start all over, right? That's their new, yeah. you know, Frank Kern, a couple others that doing, you know, what if I had to start all over? Well, it's different starting all over with a name. <laughs> <laughs> and a reputation than it is, you know, how do I start from, from zero? How do I start with zero followers and, and nobody knows my name, yeah. you know, and yet the principles are still the same. You can still, you can still build a following just by telling your story and sharing your path and your journey. And the people that identify with your path and your journey are, are the ones that are going to come along with you. And, and that's kind of the cool thing. It's important to to realize too that you don't need a million followers. Of if you have, if you have a thousand followers who identify with you and your message resonates with them, you have a six figure business right there. Oh, bigger! I bet. 
If it's a thousand, yeah. Probably. I'm just, I'm not trying to, I'm trying not to like over exaggerate, but, but yeah, a, a thousand excited followers following you could make you a million dollars a year. I, I think if you have a hundred true fans, you're, 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 you're in a pretty cool place and, and doing a lot of good stuff. And of course, if you get a hundred good fans, you can find a thousand because once you've got a hundred, you can, you can use bigger resources to, to yep. get to a thousand. Um, but the truth is you want folks that just like you, they like you for your voice. They like, they like who you are. Um, and they identify, like you said, that identify with your story and your experience and even your teaching style, right? Your, your, what you're putting out there resonates, right? Yep. Your vibration. Um, and so that's, that's a really good one to, you know, who would listen to me, the folks that need to hear your story. Yeah. Right. And so I have a story to tell. Oh, that's uh, a good one. I have, I have experience to share. I have, a I have value to add. To nice. And then of course, there's always the inadequate voice, right? The, the one that says, I don't, I don't have the skills. It kind of goes back to the first one. I'm not good enough. Yeah. Uh, but, but I think when you're specific about skills, there's a solution, right? If you don't have the skill for the thing you want to be the expert in, you can acquire it, right? Probably out there in Google land, um, you can acquire it for free or you can pay to get it, right? You can go to school. You can, there's, you can read books. Um, I think, Simon, early on in our relationship, you shared with me um, what it takes to be an expert in in something, right? Like reading reading two books, it puts you ahead of <laughs> the majority of people in a five. You okay, read, five. If you read if you read five books on any given topic, you are ahead in knowledge of ninety five percent of the people in that topic. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Like, so you could read five books and start an online business. You, well, you really can, as long as you're reading the right five. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so. There is a double-edged sword in this one, though, because there's a, there's the there's a, a subset of imposter syndrome called the expert imposter that says, "I don't know enough, so I have to learn more." Whoa. But I don't know enough, so I have to learn more, and you get stuck in this learning in loop. The loop. And action is somewhere down the road because you've, you've convinced yourself that you have to learn more before you can actually be the person that you are. Yeah, I, I think I think shiny object syndrome would fall under there, too. Right. Like, oh, yeah, I got to I got to pay for the oh. next program or the next the next uh, Facebook ad promise, the next uh, <laughs> marketing. You know, thing. I don't want I don't want to scare anybody, but do you know that I spent over forty thousand dollars in programs, courses, and coaching to learn how to do internet marketing? <laughs> you can you can buy one course from the right people, or get a coach who knows the topic, and you're done. Just take action. Yeah, I shiny object you. syndrome. <laughs> there was there's. You know, this program taught me all of this, but there's this one thing missing. Let's go find someone who has that thing. Rather than rather than the take action, take step one, and then whoa, yeah. look at step two. It's so amazing. I learned I learned how to do internet marketing because I had to, right? Because it, it it was necessary, not because I could buy this class, but because I actually started putting stuff out there and figured out what works and then changed it or modified it and who yeah yeah learn by doing <laughs> yeah absolutely especially when it comes to facebook advertising if you're not making ten thousand a month revenue you shouldn't be paying for ads yet you yeah. need organic you need organic traffic <laughs> yeah all right it's off topic but i'm tired of people buying marketing that they don't aren't ready for yet <laughs> well you, you there are there are channels that you can use to do pay-per-click advertising that aren't Facebook. So to make that distinction, Facebook is, yeah, if you're not making 10 grand a month, don't worry with Facebook yet. Because the people who are doing Facebook are spending 10 grand a month on Facebook. The ones who are killing it there. Well, you can kill it for less, but you got to have an audience and you got to, you need to build an audience organically first. Because yeah. if you can't build it organically, your paid traffic isn't going to help you. 
So, um, Very so true. we want to help help you know get out of that inadequate feeling, right? So take the next lesson, but obviously taking action. Um, the other one we just even you and I faced recently, right? Someone else will do it because they're better than me. Yeah. Or someone else is already doing it better than me. Yeah. Yeah, but again, different journey, different story. You know, I think about chefs, right? Like, oh, I'm not as good as, you know, Chef Ramsey, so I guess I shouldn't try. And yet, you look at the number of restaurants out there that have five-star or Michelin star chefs around the world. Um, I mean, you know, the idea that oh, I can't be, you know, Gordon Ramsay, so I guess I shouldn't try. <laughs> right? I mean, how many restaurants are there in a city? How many restaurants are there in a, you know, that, that still serve an audience and still make, you know, millions, probably? Um, so, so the fact... So... You made me curious. I know. <laughs> Gordon Ramsay currently has seven Michelin stars across all of his restaurants. That's pretty impressive. There are, yes, it is. But there are currently 2,817 Michelin star restaurants. Wow. <laughs> so Gordon Ramsay has two restaurants that are three and four star or wow. one, and five and two or whatever. However, that adds up. I don't know. But yeah, there's a lot out there. And there's right, a lot. I'm bunny trail out there just because I think it's fascinating that a tire company rates restaurants and and this this originated in Europe with Michelin trying to get people to drive other places and yeah. use their tires <laughs> more and so it was they, a marketing campaign they rated restaurants and now Michelin the tire company is responsible for telling us where the best restaurants in the world are um, and that's fascinating to me that that marketing idea to get people to use their tires is now a subdivision of a mich- of a tire company. It's still a tire company. The Michelin stars are still represented by the Michelin tire company. And yet, obviously, they have a big business now in evaluating restaurants at a whole other level. Um, because to get a Michelin star is like the Academy Award for restaurants. Um, and so. Oh, yeah. So- it's it's developed its own um, like um, a mythology and uh, what's the words that I'm looking for the the rituals inside that that it's, it's like um if a if a head chef of a Michelin star restaurant passes away they automatically lose one star out of deference to the chef. Wow, isn't, isn't that, that crazy? Yeah, a lot of neat stuff like that. And, but it but I have a friend who's uh, uh, one of my coaches that his goal is to visit every Michelin restaurant. <laughs> 1,817 to do. There you go. But it's, uh, it, it, every one of them is just a, an experience. It's no longer, like it's not going out to eat. It's an experience far beyond <laughs> just eating. So Absolutely. crazy that it came from a marketing. So another, idea, Oh, go ahead. I, I'm, yeah, I was about to change topics. Go ahead. I was just going to say the, the other way we say, you know, we talked about others are already doing it, but so much better. Um, better isn't necessarily right. Recognizing that each one of our journeys are different and that, you know, I, I don't have to be a Michelin star rest chef to be a really good chef in a local restaurant that, that, that serves people. Right. And I can think about my business in, in a similar way, yeah. right. Even a chef, if he has a thousand true fans that love everything that he cooks, he's going to have a really good restaurant and, and, and build a really good business around it. And so think about that first hundred fans, the first, first 10 fans, right? Like you said, Simon, once you get 10, if you can get 10, you can get a hundred. If you can get a hundred, you can get a thousand. And at a thousand, you have enough to, to generate a, a very good business if you serve them well and, and provide them with value, which of course you means you've got to continually improve yourself and and match their journey right we can't be stagnant in our own journey and, and be encouraging people along the way because yeah. obviously they're going to pass us up leaders don't stagnate yeah and if you're if your business hopes to or if your business aspires to leadership then there has to be a uh, that growth path along 
along the way. And that actually brings into the next one. I actually have, have felt this one before, um, where if I ask for help, then I'm a phony, mm. right? I have to do it all myself or I'm not authentic, right? It can be challenging for a coach, right? So I came from, I came from a, a, a variety of roles where I was a leader, right? I'm, I'm a missionary, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm the the go-to guy for the answers, or I'm a pastor, you know, and and my role is is leadership and got to have all the answers, and and so it's hard in those roles to say, oh wait, I I don't know that. Let me find out, right? Yeah, or I don't know the answer to that, but I can get it for you. And, Give me a day, and I will come back and tell you the answer to that. You know, I mean, again, these things aren't lo- uh, logical in any way. I mean, it doesn't make sense to actually say I'm a phony if I don't have the answer. Yeah. I love the share, the story that Napoleon Hill shares about Henry Ford and, and Henry Ford actually being sued to, to prove that he was, wasn't smart enough to, to run a company basically. And, and, and he, he basically accused the newspaper of slander and, and they went to court and, and they asked Henry Ford all these questions about, you know, well, how many British people, you know, British soldiers came and fought in the revolution. And, and of course his answer was so simple, you know, I heard a few less went home, <laughs> you know, um, but and what do you know about steel? <laughs> Nothing, but I employ so-and-so who happens to be the foremost expert. Blah, 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 blah. Well, he actually says I had a, I have a, a machine on my desk and I push the particular button for the particular person that I need their expertise and they come to my office and, and they give me the answer to that or this or that. And, and so Henry Ford knew that I don't need to know all the answers. I just need to know the right questions to ask and who to get that answer from. And, awesome. and that applies to all of us in, in whatever business you're in. If you know where to get the answers and you know how to share them with others, you, you can become pretty powerful in, uh, in influence and, and help. Right. Um, I think a big, a big piece of my heart is, is I simply want to help people on that pathway. Right. And, and so a a big piece of the clientele that I attract are people that are committed to helping others. And so it's not about arrogance to get on top or, or, you know, how fast I can get up the corporate ladder and make more money. It really is about, like Zig Ziglar says, if you help enough people get what they want, you'll have plenty of what you want. And, uh, and and that's the kind of entrepreneur that I attract to my programs. And and those are the kind of people that, that I want to associate with are people that are committed to, to helping others for the sake of all of us becoming better and all of us growing our businesses together and serving a, a larger community. Rising tide. Raises all ships. Absolutely. Be the even tide. though even though we're not ships. Hashtag be the tide. Be the tide. Wait, that'll get into that'll get into Alabama, folks, and then we gotta be careful. Mm. <laughs> yeah. so, so let's spend the last let's spend the last 10 minutes just reviewing how to beat imposter syndrome. Right? Yeah. First and foremost, you gotta be aware. You have to be monitoring the way you act, the way you behave, the way you step up, and the way that you talk to yourself. And and be willing to to question yourself, right? Be willing to say, why am I saying that to myself, right? Um, so I I want to encourage people to be gentle on themselves, right? This isn't this isn't a project of, all right, did it again, you know. This isn't a get frustrated and, and get mad at yourself. So so don't try to be perfect. Try to accept yourself for who you are and where you are on the journey and recognizing that this is a journey. This is a process and, and it's worth it's worth the result, right? The end result yeah. is, is worth it. You know, I'm a work in progress, I guess, is a really powerful statement to be able to say to yourself, I'm a work in progress and I'm moving towards the goal. And if you feel yourself talking badly to yourself, here's a litmus test. If you heard your best friend's spouse talking to them the way that you're talking to yourself right now, would you feel uncomfortable? Nice. (laughs) If the answer is no, dig. 
<laughs> raise yourself above the playing field and say, what's going on here? Yeah. Yeah, I like that one. Yeah, that's powerful. And I think another powerful tool is is just change your body language, right? If you're if you're getting into negative thoughts and negative more and more of these negative statements are coming through, stand up, do some jumping jacks, you know, uh, smile. Power pose. Power pose. <laughs> exactly. I'm, I've got this <laughs> Superman. <laughs> yeah. Uh, your, uh, your body language can be very powerful. So next step is to document it, right? Like, Hold yourself accountable to it. Write it down, right? Oh, I'm my way to work today. I said, oh, I'm frustrated. Oh, I'm stupid. Oh, I keep making that same mistake. Yeah. Write those down and then write down the change, right? We talked about being able to change your language, turn it around, write the positive I am statement, right? So I'm on the journey, right? I'm I'm in process is, is a quick one to start with um, and, and document the the successes, right? Oh, I was able to do that. Oh, I'm, I'm getting better every day. Every day in every way, I'm getting better and better. It's a great affirmation. Absolutely. One thing, one thing to be careful of though, when you're caught in one of those negative spirals where you're talking poorly to yourself, that's not the time to try to build the affirmation. That's the time to journal the feeling, talk about how you're feeling and why and and document the the what comes up for you close your eyes and listen to your inner voice and write down what you're feeling and ask where does that come from why do i feel this way then when you're outside of the stimulus and you're no longer in that negative spiral that's the time to go back and say okay when i feel this way this is what i'm going to say and you create an affirmation that addresses the why yeah, the trigger can be really important, right? Being able to, to, sometimes we don't recognize the trigger until we've written it down a couple of times. And then we're like, oh, now I see the trigger, right? I mean, all of us know the trigger to cuss and, you know, we smash our finger, right? If I smash my finger, cuss words tend to come out, right? Um, but if something else is causing me to cuss, I got to figure out what is this, what is the smash my finger, right? What is the thing that's causing me to, to and if I do that, a couple times, like even driving, sometimes it, the road rage isn't necessarily road rage. It's this one particular thing, man, they just don't use their turn signal. Right. And then, and then you realize, Oh, it's just their turn signal. Why am I getting so upset about just something like that? Right. So trigger, recognizing the trigger, documenting the trigger, and then allowing yourself separation. Next time this trigger happens, this is how I want to react. This is how I want to change it. Um, and give yourself grace. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, be patient with the process. Yeah, give yourself grace because chances are you're gonna you're gonna mess up once or twice in there. It is perfectly okay. Two and a half hours later to go. Ah, you know what I should have done? I figured out what I was supposed to do in that minute, and I and I missed it. I'll get it next time. Yeah, that's the one you want to write down for sure. If you get a chance to say, "Oh, I love it when I." As a counselor, as a pastor, I constantly, you know, met with couples, met with folks, and it'd be driving home. I'd realize, oh, I should have told them this. Ah, <laughs> were you ruminating? Ah, well, not necessarily ruminating. It was that realization, like, oh, that would have been a perfect thing to share. Okay. And and <laughs> and you can either you can either let it go, or you can say, oh, I'm going to grow from this, and I write it down, and I'm and next time I have that chance. I can share it and it makes me a better counselor and of course makes me more human because they recognize, you know, that we're all on this journey together, right? It's not like any of us has, has made it. There is no made it. <laughs> There's no landing zone that just says, woohoo, you made it. Here you are. <laughs> You've arrived and you're done. Cause, cause once you go stagnant, you're, you're sliding, you're dying, yeah. right? We're decomposing. Um, so and then, of course, our, our favorite, fake it till you make it. <laughs> yeah. right? Believe in yourself to the level to say, I've got this, I can do it, right? Even if you don't believe you can. Yeah. Practice, practicing confidence builds confidence. 
It's a skill like anything else. If you if you just say, no, I'm not confident, I don't want to try that, you'll never become confident. It doesn't somehow mystically get bestowed upon you one night in your sleep. Or you know, <laughs> it doesn't take, you know, some sort of, you know, accident for you to uh, suddenly discover your confidence. Confidence is a skill. And you can literally put yourself into situations that are easily recoverable from if you slip. Um, I remember when I was first, like, when I got out of high school, I could barely look strangers in the face. And I, I, I know that that's, sounds odd now, but just having a conversation, especially with a girl, especially if I was attracted to her, right? No way. <laughs> Couldn't do it. <laughs> but I challenged myself when I started saying, no, I don't want to do this. I don't want to go through my life feeling this way anymore. Um, go to a restaurant you don't normally go to with the intent. doesn't matter if you buy any food. Go there with the intent of looking the person taking your order in the eye and saying hi to them. Wow. And then after a while, after you do that two or three times, say hi and compliment them. Right. And, and they're tiny little things. And since you're going to a restaurant, you don't normally go to, if you mess up and feel completely ashamed and embarrassed and you couldn't face that again, no way, no how you never go back to the restaurant. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> confidence definitely generates confidence, right? It does. And, and I think it is a skill that you can practice and you can improve. And I think just like the other things we talked about action, motion, right? Mm. Action and motion create momentum. And I think action and motion will create that can will will develop confidence the same way that you'll develop skills, the same way that you'll develop your business. And the power pose is powerful. This this step, oh. standing with your hands on your hips, feet slightly spread, head up, looking forward or wherever. This pose, they have actually had people, they've done an experiment where they took two groups of people going into an interview. And they had one group of people stand like this for three minutes, and the other set of people stand like this for oh. three minutes. And the people who stood in the power pose not only performed better in the interview, but when they, they took uh, swabs afterward, and they had higher levels of testosterone, the um, testosterone, uh, what does it do? Well, they had higher levels of testosterone, which is the confidence hormone, and they had uh, reduced levels of cortisol, which is the stress hormone. But imagine if you if you spend three minutes in the power pose with I am statements. Yes. Right? I am on the journey. I, like I, am, I am confident, and I'm going to do a great job today. I'm going to add value to people. I'm going to... You know, I'm going to love people today. <laughs> I am lovable, right? Like all of those I am statements can be so powerful, um, especially in a power pose. Um, and so I'm going to knock it out of the park, right? Like imagine just <laughs> I, I've got this, right? Being I, able to stand there, I've got this. I am a powerful, energetic, experiential being having a human experience that I can do anything in. There you go. Hey, if you're struggling – with that voice in your head and, and uh, I hope that we've been giving you some tools that, that could help today, but yeah, share, share your story in, in, in the comments and, and tell us, tell us what you're wrestling with. Uh, we'd love to have a conversation here in the group. Um, we, we are entrepreneur coaches. We like to focus on, on mindset and helping entrepreneurs get where they want to go, right? <laughs> Believe yeah. in themselves at the level that their thinking matches their actions and their actions are taking them to another level. And so um, we want to help you in your journey. And so share your journey with us and let's have, let's continue the conversation in the comments and uh, look forward to seeing you next week. I, uh, what are we doing next, next week is. Uh... Uh, that's a really good question. Next week, we are going to be talking about drum roll, please. <laughs> You caught me off guard there. Next week, we're talking about um, examining the impact of social media on the six core human needs, and it's called toxicity versus connection. Ooh, powerful. That could be really good. I look forward to it. 
Yeah. I look always, it's challenging, right? To encourage entrepreneurs to, to avoid the toxicity and take advantage of social media in the positive, the positive yeah. side. So that would be a great conversation. About, I imagine we're going to be talking quite a bit about uh, ways to filter, edit, and limit your exposure to social media that distracts you. So Nice. Thanks for joining us today. Have a great week and uh, go out there confidently.